Now, let me invite uh, Renee DeResta to join us and introduce our uh, sort of first proposal. Renee is a research manager at the Stanford Internet Observatory, part of the Cyber Policy Center here at Stanford. Her work investigates the spread of narratives across social and media networks, and she regularly assists policymakers in understanding and responding to the problem. She's advised Congress, the State Department, and many other academic, civic, and business uh, organizations. Renee, welcome. Thank you so much. It's great to be here this morning. Uh, sorry, I didn't even get a notice that I was being let into the room. So, <laughs> um, you're in now. Honored, yes, honored to be here today, and uh, looking forward to this conversation. Let's, uh, let's see. So we have. I see now. Um, Ashish. Kate. I see Frank. Okay, great. So it looks like all of our panelists are here. Like I can't see Ashish yet. I think, uh, I think what we'll do is I'm going to start by having the panelists briefly introduce themselves, just give one or two lines of bio, and then we're going to dive right in uh, with Frank Fukuyama presenting his middleware proposal. Uh, Kate, would you like to start? Sure. I'm Kate Starbuck. I'm an associate professor at the University of Washington in a department called Human Centered Design and Engineering. Um, my work sits at sort of the intersection of uh, human-computer interaction and um, what we used to call crisis informatics, or the study of how people um, organize and use social media and other online platforms during disaster events. Uh, and more recently, I focused on the study of online misinformation and disinformation. Thank you. Katrina? Hi, I'm a computer scientist at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and my work uh, focuses on the mathematical foundations of topics like machine learning, data privacy, and algorithmic fairness. Great. And Ashish and Frank. While Frank is muted, uh, the, I'm Ashish Koel. Uh, I'm a professor of uh, management science and engineering and by courtesy computer science at Stanford, and my research area is algorithms. And I'm Frank Fukuyama. I'm a political scientist at the Freeman Spogli Institute uh, uh, at Stanford and normally look at politi international uh, political questions. Thank you, everyone. So we are going to focus this panel uh, around a discussion of a proposal um, that Frank and Ashish are going to present to us, uh, discussing a, a series of um, thinking that they've been doing over the last few months about middleware. Middleware as a solution to excessive concentration of platform power uh, and areas in which middleware might potentially provide a uh, mitigation, mitigating some of the harms of the worst uh, excesses of social media on things like misinformation, harassment, and a variety of other areas. And they're going to walk us through their proposal to start, and then uh, we are going to discuss it. So I will let Frank I believe share his screen and begin the presentation. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I really appreciate uh, HEI giving us the opportunity to explain our middleware proposal. The origin of this was a uh, Stanford working group uh, I established at the beginning of 2020. The original title was the Stanford Working Group on Antitrust and Platform Power, uh, something like that. Uh, we had a nice interdisciplinary group, uh, but we quickly began to realize that antitrust was really the wrong framework in which to uh, think about the problem that concerned us. Uh, antitrust law, the way it has developed in the United States, is, is focused really just on economic issues. There was a time when politics was a factor, but uh, it's been focused since the 1980s on economic harms. And as we started to think about what was really bothering people about the platforms, uh, it struck us that the, uh, the problem was really related to the way that the platforms, these large platforms, that's basically just Facebook, Google, and Twitter, had become the primary uh, means by which Americans communicated uh, politically with one another, uh, and that this was uh, uh, very problematic. Uh, I think that uh, there was uh, both a normative and a practical concern here. The normative concern is that uh, no private profit-making company should 
have this kind of power over political speech. And because they were profit making, they were not making good decisions. They wanted to maximize clicks and user attention and therefore tended towards more salacious, outrageous uh, material and were therefore contributing to polarization and the deterioration uh, of discourse uh, over the uh, over the internet. The practical issue was that we simply felt that these platforms uh, didn't have the capacity to really make these political judgments, even if it was legitimate for them to do so. And by the way, you know, our report focused mostly on the United States. But this issue exists in all of the, I don't know, 160 com countries in which uh, Facebook operates, for example, where, you know, we constantly get complaints about takedowns in favor of authoritarian governments uh, and uh, restrictions on uh, uh, political communication, criticism, uh, and so forth. Uh, so it seemed to us that really what we needed to focus on was reducing the power of these platforms. The power really lies in their ability, ability to amplify or to silence uh, particular political uh, voices, and that this was really the problem with platform scale. Uh, if these were much, much smaller companies, it wouldn't matter that much, but because they have such a broad reach, uh, they can extend uh, bad information into domains that you know, would normally not ever, uh, I mean, like the yoga moms uh, all of a sudden um, adopting QAnon theories because some yoga guru, you know, decided that this was an interesting thing. Um, so that was the origin of our concern. Uh, we changed the name of the working group to the Stanford uh, uh, Working Group on Platform Scale. Uh, and we began to think through what some of the remedies were. I can go through the um, you know, the, the ones that have been put forward uh, very quickly, which we largely rejected because we just don't think that they're, they're going to work. So the most obvious one is regulation. Uh, this is what the Europeans are trying to do with their new Digital Services Act. You just tell the platforms you can and cannot do uh, X, Y, and Z. In the United States, we really are into private regulation. And so our debate has focused on Section 230 rather than actual state regulation. But the reasons that it works in Northern European countries like Germany or, or the Netherlands uh, shows why it doesn't work in the United States uh, because they still have a social consensus, a social political consensus that allows them to empower regulators to make these sorts of decisions. We just don't have that. I mean, this Section 230 debate, liberals want to silence Donald Trump and conservatives want to give him a megaphone. You know, uh, there, there's no agreement on that. So it seemed to us that that was not, uh, that was not workable. Another uh, possibility is to use uh, privacy uh, legislation to limit the power of these companies. So in theory, under GDPR, you cannot take data you've accumulated in one domain uh, like books and apply it to another domain like baby diapers, the way Amazon has. Uh, that's problematic uh, just in the sense that it kind of locks in the first movers who are already sitting on um, uh, mountains of data, uh, and uh, that data would be uh, protected from you know, upstarts. Uh, third possibility is antitrust law itself, and many people, you know, long for an AT&T-style breakup of Facebook. Uh, I think that if you look at that possibility, it it really does not seem very um, uh, appealing because the last time we did one of these antitrust suits against Microsoft, the suit lasted for ten years. I, I do think it had beneficial effects, but our problem is much more immediate. We, we've got to solve this problem before the next uh, a couple of election cycles. Uh, and in any event, it's not clear it would work because of next network externalities, which would lead a baby Facebook, for example, to grow up into a uh, into a, a, a another uh, parent Facebook. Uh, so that's the reason that we started thinking about a third uh, or a fourth possibility, which was the idea of middleware. Uh, so middleware is a uh, uh, is software that would sit between the user and the platform. 
uh, it would take material that's in the platform's feed, but it would filter that content based on the knobs and dials that the uh, that the user set. I think one of the terrible things about platform power today is that people have no control over what the platform serves them up. Uh, you can kind of intuit what the algorithm may be thinking, but uh, there's no way of choosing to get certain forms of content and not others. And our view was that what you wanted to do was to create a competitive layer uh, of middleware providers that would offer services uh, that you could add on, uh, let's say, to your browser that would filter uh, that content uh, prior to its uh, getting to you according to um, uh, criteria that, that you yourself uh, set. Uh, and this is basically the uh, uh, the proposal we put out there. I should just uh, anticipate a couple of reactions that we've gotten as we've put out this idea, uh, and, and they're real objections. I mean, one is a business model, because it's not clear how you're going to make money off of providing middleware. And I think you'd have to have regulatory change that would open up the APIs of these platforms and maybe even force some revenue uh, 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 revenue sharing uh, on their part. Um, the bigger issue for many people was that middleware might actually reinforce filter bubbles and the compartmentalization of political discourse in the United States. Uh, and that's true. Uh, and in fact, in earlier discussions we've had, you know, people have basically expressed the desire to stamp out hate speech and conspiracy theories altogether. And in our view, that cannot be the uh, object of public policy, not at least in the United States with our First Amendment, uh, that we uh, do not put restrictions on what people can speak, uh, even if it's false, salacious, untrue, uh, whatever. Uh, what we do want to do is to try to limit the spread of really bad uh, information. And so middleware was our solution. So my colleague Ashish can now do a little uh, demo and talk about the more technical aspects of uh, uh, of what we imagine this product would be like. Thanks a lot, Frank. Uh, so uh, just to sort of uh, explain uh, one of the reasons, uh, one of the motivations behind the approach that we took uh, over the last two or three years, uh, a lot of tech CEOs have increasingly taken the position that they don't actually want to be the arbiters of uh, what the public sees and what it doesn't see. Uh, so, for example, uh, Jack Dorsey mentioned that uh, it'd be great to have uh, let people choose their own algorithms to rank the content or to create their own algorithms to rank it. Now, of course, people can't do it. Uh, a consumer sitting at their home is not going to be able to sort of choose their own algorithms or create their own algorithms. So what could do it? And that's where the middleware idea comes in. These would be software products that would interconnect with Facebook, uh, Amazon, Apple, Twitter, Google APIs, and allow consumers to shape their feeds and influence the algorithms that these dominant platforms currently employ. Okay. And observe that these platforms are, these products are interconnecting with these big platforms. They're not directly interconnecting with the user. And that part is important. So an end user can choose among a variety of middleware providers. These middleware providers will then tag political content with labels such as misleading, needs additional context, etc. They can also provide ranking algorithms, but then observe that these filters and ranking algorithms are applied by the platform, uh, not by the middleware. So what sits in the middle of the user, despite the name middleware, what sits in the middle of the user and the platform is the editorial judgment of the middleware provider and not a software layer. To make it even more obvious, uh, and I know that we all hate block diagrams, but this one sort of I'm going to just use this to illustrate something quickly. Um, the What we're envisaging, and of course, uh, these things will evolve uh, if the middleware idea gets traction, but what we're envisaging is uh, sort of a separation between the middleware on one side and the user on the other side. So no user data flows to the middleware. Okay. 
what happens is the middleware, the user chooses middleware, okay? And then whatever data the middleware needs comes directly from the platform. Okay? Whatever information the middleware sends, sends directly to the platform. Okay? And then the platform is the one that applies these uh, filters and these ranking criteria. And that provides a separation um, uh, which is beneficial for two reasons. One reason is what Frank alluded to, and I'm going to allude to again, which is that you need to have a business model to support it. And if you actually took middleware and you put it as a layer between the user and the platform, then you're taking away the primary way in which platforms monetize themselves. And that sounds, does that sounds, uh, A, something that platforms would resist fiercely as opposed to embrace. B, that does risk taking away the main revenue model of these platforms and um, risk throwing the baby away with the bathwater, right? And second, if there's a closer coupling between the user and the middleware, then the privacy problems start to get more uh, complex. And in this particular setting, setting because there's a separation, we at least not making the privacy problem worse. Yeah. So uh, here's what middleware might look like if you apply to Google search. Uh, uh, these results would be based, uh, the results that you see might be based upon preferred news sources, which uh, the user, uh, which the middleware has chosen on behalf of the user and the user has actually chosen the middleware. So let me give you a, a very simple uh, instance of what this looks like. This is a quick demo that we put together. As you can see, uh, in this particular demo, there's a choice of middlewares. Uh, for example, let's say I've chosen the Heritage Foundation. And let's see what that would look like uh, for a specific tweet. So for example, the Heritage Foundation leans right. So it may actually be more sympathetic to people who are uh, uh, skeptical of vaccines. So this particular tweet is labeled as needs context. And uh, the tweet actually says that the vaccine has a lot of adverse effects, removed before it gets removed, shared before it gets removed. So this tweet is heavily pushing the idea that vaccines are harmful, we should not get vaccinated. Okay. And the Heritage Foundation, because it's sympathetic to perhaps uh, the First Amendment concerns of uh, people who are against vaccines, might just say needs context. Okay. And the claims in this video are unverified, okay. which is something, but it's still somewhat weak. If on the other hand, my middleware provider were well, the New York Times, um, which is somewhat left-leaning uh, and is not sympathetic to vaccine uh, uh, hesitancy, it might actually label the same thing as misleading and actually remove it. Okay. So, so based on the middleware you choose, uh, users will see a different experience on the same platform. Okay. Uh, but the users are not making this determination. Uh, and because these middleware providers themselves are large organizations, they presumably have the resources, uh, both technically and the manpower, to keep uh, these labels uh, current and reasonable. So what could, uh, you, you could apply the same thing to Amazon, for example, even though that's not a primary use case. Uh, for example, you could say that uh, some of the ranking algorithms uh, may come from uh, uh, a third party, which people can choose. Some of the advantages of middleware, like Frank said, is that it dilutes the control of dominant platforms. I'm going to skip this because I think Frank already elo uh, fairly eloquently alluded to it. Uh, this is just a, a screenshot of something that I already showed you. Okay. Now, what are the next set of decisions we need to make uh, if middleware were to become a reality? Uh, the first is a role and the function, like who, who mandates middleware? And uh, just to build on what uh, Frank was saying, our belief is that uh, uh, we need to mandate that we need to mandate this uh, in a regulatory setting. It's not going to just happen uh, by uh, the free market. There needs to be an attractive business model, and there needs to be a technical framework. And these last two problems we think are fairly solvable. Uh, for example, on the business model side, uh, the business model of the platforms is not being altered in any way. So at least the at least the core business model of the internet survives uh, the middleware uh, idea. And then you could have revenue sharing agreements, uh, arrangements between middleware providers and dominant platforms. And uh, middleware providers might be able to charge user fees or sell advertising directly. And on the one hand, this might sound highly hypothetical. On the other hand, uh, there are already companies emerging which do this. So we just, uh, last month, uh, we found out about this company, Preamble, uh, which basically seems to be very aligned uh, with our view, they want to create middleware for AI ethics and safety. 
And there's some uh, causal connection between our proposal and the fact that they are calling themselves a middleware company. And they're definitely optimistic that they'll be able to sort of provide these middleware services uh, uh, for different middleware providers and, and get money from, uh, get revenue from platforms directly. So this is not, uh, this fact that this uh, business model can emerge is not very hypothetical. This actually is happening. Uh, the people making an, the serious attempt to make this happen as we speak. Uh, technically, uh, we need to develop a sophisticated technical architecture so middleware providers can effectively communicate labels, rankings, ratings to a variety of platforms. And we don't actually believe this is that far away. Uh, uh, in the last, just in the last two or three years, uh, AI tools have come so far that natural language processing has changed from the point where you would get a huge corpus uh, and train your own model to where you would consume an API like GPT-3 and do a small amount of transfer learning and modify it. And in our group, uh, I, I showed you a demo, which is primarily a front-end demo. Uh, in our group, uh, uh, this group that Frank and I are part of, we're now trying to prove that these, uh, make a prototype which actually demonstrates that these APIs exist and they can be leveraged. And once again, it's not our goal to actually become a middleware provider. It's not our goal to make a product. We just want to demonstrate technical feasibility. So that's our next step. Uh, what does middleware not do? It does not reduce the echo chamber, which means that if this idea becomes a reality, we will need a robust auditing framework. Okay. Uh, there's also other things that we might have to think about. For example, maybe the platform can flag content that different providers disagree on. And the one issue that we haven't really touched upon, uh, and that I feel like uh, at least I don't have a good answer to, is what about censorious regimes? Uh, and uh, just to be a front, uh, uh, there is a there's a concern that uh, if middleware if the middleware architecture becomes a reality, then uh, uh, Iran or India or China or like a bunch any any number of censorious regimes, uh, Hungary might want to have uh, want to become a middleware provider for their own country. We don't directly address privacy, uh, even though we took some uh, steps to make sure that our, our uh, suggested architecture does not make the privacy problem worse. But we are really excited that while that's not our main goal, the core premise of middleware actually applies to privacy settings as well. So it's quite conceivable that we'd have a middleware for privacy where the user chooses their privacy settings. So for example, a high school. And then when you go to Facebook, all the settings, when you go to Facebook, whenever you get the GDPR pop in about cookie opt-in opt and opt-out, the middleware applies those settings to you. Uh, to conclude, uh, we, middleware takes editorial power away from a small number of technology platforms. Frank and I have talked about this a lot, so we are really, uh, I, I want to stop here so that we can hear from uh, Kate and Katrina. Thank you so much for this thoughtful presentation. Um, I, I think we'll go to Katrina next, uh, who has also done some deep thinking on this problem. Looking forward to hearing her reactions to this presentation. Great, thanks so much for the opportunity to join the conversation here today. And thanks for this proposal. Um, so I should say for context that probably about seven years ago, Kobe Nisim, who's a computer scientist at Georgetown, and I started what has evolved into what we now call the Data Co-ops Project, which is our attempt, um, which is now really one of a rich landscape of initiatives to more deeply understand the problems that we see in the current data ecosystem, and to think in a deeply cross-disciplinary way about the interventions that might help right some of those wrongs. And my thinking and perspectives that I'll share here today have been really shaped by that work with Kobe and with the, the growing work of colleagues and uh, students and postdocs who've been involved in that project. So thanks to them. Um, I hope you'll forgive that I, I'd like to sort of pop up a level in some sense, um, because much of the work that we've been doing in this context also focuses on a middleware proposal of sorts, which we call data co-ops. And I'd like to try to borrow some of the terminology and the framing of the problem space that we've been using in that work, because I think some of it might be helpful in helping frame the conversation here today. Um, first, I wanna say that there's a lot that I really appreciate and identify with in this proposal, in the concerns that motivate it, in the recognition that as a society, we're dealing with problems that probably can't be legislated away and really do need a joint tech policy intervention. And also, in the recognition that you're giving to the major challenges that really any intervention in this space is gonna face, related to implementation, adoption, potential industry resistance, the risks of intervening and actually replicating harms or amplifying harms or creating new harms. So I really appreciate all of that. But maybe I'll start by saying that one of the things that I most like about this proposal 
is where it places its intervention in the data ecosystem. And that's, in my mind, at the interface between individual users and platforms. Though I have to say, I didn't follow all the boxes in the, the diagram, so maybe you'll correct me on my interpretation. So I really think, though, that this spot is a really crucial place for the intervention to lie. And maybe I'll take a moment now to be explicit about why. So first of all, the place where my data meets your data and our data meets the data of our friends and of our families and people from all around the globe, that's the place where that data goes from being my data and your data to becoming our data, our collective data. And that's the place where our data, both figuratively and formally, really in a mathematical sense, gains its meaning, it gains its power, it gains its, its value. And so if one of your goals, and I think it is, is to disrupt the concentration of economic power, of, politi of political power, and also the concentration of the power to decide how our collective data will be used for us all and against us all, it's gonna be critical to intervene at that point at which that power and that value come together. And it really comes together in some sort of super additive sense where really in a formal sense, our data is more than the sum of its parts. So one of the framings of the harms of the data ecosystem that I've been using that I think helps put the strengths and weaknesses of some potential interventions into relief is to coarsely and imperfectly divide those harms into two categories. The first category I call the outgoing vector. So these are the harms that accrue from the process of my data going out from me and being collected by various platforms and entities. So think here about traditional concerns regarding data privacy, security, consent to collection, data deletion rights, stuff like that. And I wanna separate that, although it's an imperfect separation, from harms that accrue along what I call the incoming vector. So the incoming vector covers the information flow from platforms inward towards each of us. And what's crucial here is that often that incoming flow is really highly personalized and tailored. The personalized ads, the tailored search results, the curated news, the social media feeds, the next video that comes up on YouTube. And while a few years ago, we as a society weren't really talking much about the harms of the incoming vector, now they're all over the headlines. Concerns like unfairness and the personalized opportunities were being given, polarization and the personalized worldviews that are curated for each of us, amplification of, of fake news, harmful content, and this sort of concomitant toxic undercurrent that we see of distrust in institutions and in each other. And what I find useful about this framing of the outgoing the incoming vector is for me at least, it highlights where those incoming vector harms come from. And a big part of what I see is driving those harms and what part of what really makes them so effective is the inferences that are being drawn about each of us and the personalization that's being done. It's really one thing to splash hateful content or conspiracy theories on a billboard, but it's really quite another thing to use patterns learned from all of us to progressively refine that harmful content, to learn how to make it as effective as possible, to feed it to those who are most susceptible at the moment at which they're most susceptible, and to give them the impression that this is reality. And that personalization along the incoming vector is only possible because platforms can leverage information about us collectively. They have a very good sense of what I'll respond to because they've learned intricate patterns gleaned from the behaviors, not just of people I'm close to, but people who I've never met. And so it's the collective nature of our data that's in my mind driving a lot of the harms that, that I wanna to discuss today. And crucially, unless an intervention also enjoys a collective perspective, bringing together both the incoming vector information and the outgoing vector information of a large swath of people, I really think it has no hope of identifying or quantifying or really responding to those incoming vector harms. Even sort of in a very technical definitional sense, many of these harms of the incoming vector don't even make sense at the level of individuals. Things like discrimination or polarization, they really only exist in a broader societal context. So that's from my perspective, why I'm so happy to see where your middleware approach intervenes and that it sits at this position where you have the potential for this collective perspective at this place where a handful of platforms meet a mass of individuals. Um, so I'm guessing with such a bold proposal, you're used to hearing that it's 
not realistic, that it's too ambitious, that it's too radical, that you've bitten off more than you can chew. And I actually kind of want to go in the opposite direction and say, I think this proposal isn't bold enough or broad enough. I think it's in some sense scoped too narrowly in the information harms that it considers. And I'm afraid that this narrow scoping might miss important relationships between those harms. I feel like you're already getting in there right at the right spot in the data ecosystem. And there's so much more to the incoming vector harms than just questions of which news gets flagged or blocked or promoted. And I also think that the proposal maybe isn't bold enough in that it doesn't seem to consider bringing in data from the outgoing vector. So the data about each of us. But I worry that without understanding who is being shown what, and in some sense why, that you won't have the ability to identify problematic patterns of personalization. And I worry that it's personalization that's really the engine driving a lot of these harms. Um, but really my deepest concern here is I feel that the proposal is not fully engaging with the privacy concerns. Um, and in my opinion, those really need to be front and center in any intervention that would change the way the data flows. You say, for example, that you know, no user data reaches the middleware, but actually that incoming vector of content that's being provided from the platforms, that it contains incredibly rich personal information. Um, and I worry that unless meaningful, provable privacy is an absolute first order constraint, that the new harms that you might open up here could actually even dwarf our current woes. Um, so I'll stop there. I'll say thank you again very much for this proposal. I think this does a lot to advance and open up the discussion in this space. And I'll pass the baton now. Thank you so much. Uh, Kate, let's have your reactions now. All right. Yeah, thank, thank you all for uh, inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, and thank you for this, this idea. It's a, it's a really compelling idea, and I, and I appreciate this proposal. There's some really interesting aspects here. And I do think, you know, I think that the solution to some of the problems that 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 in the way I frame them, and I'll get to that later. Um, I think that some of the solutions are, um, you know, uh, this intersection between platform design and, and a new kind of media literacy, a, med a media literacy that leverages additional signals about the information we receive and how that information has reached us. And I and I do see this as being right in that in that place. And I think it's it's really interesting. It would open up. Um, more possibilities for actually innovating on those kinds of media literacy um, uh, design pieces and in integrating media literacy into the design of, of, of platforms or, or how we see the information from platforms. But my response here um, is going to center on this, this question of framing. And, and I know that you're, you're, you've dealt with this in the original article as well as some of the responses, but is this you know, proposal primarily about reducing the power of the big companies or is it about reducing harms of online systems? I think the proposal does a really good job of, of addressing the first, but I'm not convinced that it will well address the second. Um, and my critiques are similar to ones that I think you all have heard and responded to before, but I'm gonna offer them here again for, for visibility. Um, and especially as this particular session has been sort of proposed under mis and disinformation, that's what I know best. And that's kind of going to be um, my perspective. I'm all for shrinking the power of the companies, but my view is that um, that alone is not likely going to fix problems like disinformation, polarization, hate speech, mass delusion, um, and these kinds of things. Um, my, my team has been studying online misinformation and online disinformation for nearly a decade. And we don't just quantify it. We qualitatively analyze it. Um, we read content, hundred, probably hundreds of thousands of tweets and Facebook posts and TikTok videos at this point. And to be honest, our researchers are hurting um, because we've seen things, um, vulnerabilities in people, in our in our fellow Americans, in our in our loved ones, and in ourselves, uh, and things that. Um, you know, we can't unsee uh, about the vulnerability of not just democracy, but of uh, humanity under these conditions. We've also begun to see how some of these toxicities have become embedded in the network structure and the algorithms that shape what we see on these platforms. And my sense is that the middleware that, that you're proposing doesn't quite get there. Um, it's very much about content and not about algorithms and, and network structure. And I'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, and I'm worried that because it sits at this content piece and, and because people can self-select which middleware they use, that it may make the situation worse. Um, so there's this piece in, in the proposal where you center on that idea of sort of, a, of freedom of speech and, and this level playing field on which ideas compete. And unfortunately, from my perspective as a researcher in these spaces, 
um, this playing field is tilted in favor of misinformation and sensationalism just by the ways that we create our communities and the ways that content reaches us. And I'm not sure that a middleware focused on content moderation and labeling is going to make a big dent in that. And I don't think it'll stop the erosion of democracy or sort of things like ethnic violence in some of these other countries that we've seen. Uh, and in fact, I'm afraid that it could amplify some of those. So thinking sort of adversarially, <laughs> as I've begun to do from the disinformation world uh, about middleware, we can imagine how popular political entities or social or religious ones could, could use middleware, develop their own to reify their power, strengthening existing echo chambers and building new ones. Um, repeatedly, we see a large portion of, of people choose to engage with partisan clickbait and eschew journalism, um, some even calling traditional journalism fake news. And I can imagine those folks choosing a middleware product that, that uh, I can't imagine those folks choosing a middleware product that improves the situation. I think we'll get, you know, Fox News watches will have their middleware, MSNBCers will have theirs, and conspiracy theorists and even white supremacists will have their own, sort of the parlors of middleware to name Renee's favorite platform. Um, at the same time, um, I think we have to remember that it's not the year 2000 or 2010 or even 2016. We have a massively polarized electorate, many of whom have developed these appetites for outrage clickbait. If, if they weren't innate, we've developed them. Uh, and a significant portion of the population is settling into sort of a mass delusion within the information ecosystems that push things like QAnon, anti-vaccine narratives, anti-democratic false narratives of voter fraud. And we've seen the political and media elites who have figured out how to leverage these toxic information ecosystems and this mass delusion for political power and financial gain. And they recognize that this is a ticket to their power. Um, many of them seem to. Uh, and perhaps this kind of solution introduced at the dawn of social media would have brought us to a different place, but I'm worried that it won't be able to bring us out of our current place. Um, my sense is that the editorial moves of middleware, especially the middleware most people will choose, will look more like hyper-partisan media and less like journalism. Stepping into the weeds a bit on a couple of points, um, I also question the, the reliance on labeling as a, as a primary kind of manifestation. I don't think we've seen a clear indication, not in the papers that I've been reading, that these labels work, especially on politically polarized content. Um, and my sense is the toxicities on these platforms are not primarily related to individual pieces of content that can therefore be labeled to solve the problem, um, but are really the toxicities are related to the algorithms, the algorithms that amplify and recommend and create influence. And then the networks that take shape through those recommendations and reflect and embed and reify that influence. In the model that, that I think as I interpreted it, that you propose, the platforms still own the algorithms and the networks. So this just in, it, it addresses the content, but doesn't really get to the heart of the problem, in, in my view. Um, and we also know that people will generally stick to the defaults, right? So this idea that users will, will address their own settings. Um, I, what we've seen is most people, when they get a system, will stick to the defaults. It may be that they will download somebody else's defaults for them. Um, again, like letting an influencer choose, uh, choose what their settings will be. But very rarely do we see folks spending a lot of time or, or taking that time to, to address their settings themselves. So again, I, I don't know um, if, if this kind of gets at, at the heart um, of the problem. So yeah, I think the proposal does a great job of addressing this problem that companies have too much power. I think we all agree to that. I really like the, inter the intersection of like where it hits with maybe new me media literacies, um, but I'm worried that it doesn't get to the heart of the problem on sort of algorithms and networks. And I'm really uh, also worried about people sort of continuing into their hyper-partisan bubbles. So thank you for letting me share my comments. Thank you. Um, we'll give both Frank and Ashish a chance to respond in a second. I want to take moderator prerogative to just kind of um, echo some of the, uh, um, reflect back some of what we've kind of covered here so far. So there's a question of what problem we're solving, right? Which is a very, when we talk about social media regulation and what we want to see addressed either through regulatory efforts or through the creation of a middleware and, uh, and, and or, or through the, um, trying to prevail upon platforms to undertake some sort of self-regulatory action, there is a set of different problems that are interrelated. And in this particular case, while reducing the power of the platforms themselves in content moderation, uh, the kind of trade-off appears to be the potential for increasing polarization or, or the prevalence of those filter bubbles. There's, uh, we've discussed the distinction between the content creation and moderation angle versus what this um, does not touch on quite so much, which is the formation of the networks, the structure of the networks, and how that content is disseminated. So the individual 
uh, piece of it versus the network, the um, the network and the transmission piece, sort of um, not entirely clear. Does a label persist if someone shares content along? Does a middleware provider do what Twitter does in this case, where they actually prevent the further transmission of certain types of content through that act of labeling in an attempt to try to tie an idea that something has been labeled because it has a potential for harm and therefore should be um, perhaps throttled? There's some interesting questions there regarding if we were to uh, take that power out of the platforms and give it to the middleware providers, uh, do they, does that in any way impact the transmission across the network or would this be largely to kind of clean up the feed or, or privilege the feeds of, of individual uh, users? Um, I want to touch on some of the questions related to um, kind of buy-in from platforms themselves to inquire if, uh, if you know if the folks have spoken with them at all or where the appetite is for an implementation in, in terms of actually executing on the idea. But I'd love to open it up for responses to um, you know to the uh, to the to the co-panelists and their critiques. Uh, okay, um, Ashish, there are some technical questions that you might. Uh, like to answer? So I, th I think uh, purely from a, again, purely from a technical point of view, as opposed to a normative point of view, I think uh, Katrina's uh, main concern was that this is not directly addressing privacy or that this might actually make the privacy problem worse. Um, that's something we absolutely uh, uh, want to address and solve. So, for example, that, that's the primary re reason why we had these uh, this separation, where user data doesn't actually flow to the middleware provider. Uh, in addition, uh, what we are envisaging is that while our focus has been on uh, uh, political speech, uh, and that's where our proposal is framed, we feel like one big problem with privacy settings is that these privacy regulations come in, and there are these lots of buttons and settings for individuals to choose, and they can't. And so really envisaging a situation where there's regulation which says that uh, my son's high school or the Palo Alto Unified School District or the California Board of Public Education will be a middleware provider. And whenever a child goes to Facebook uh, or Twitter or TikTok, uh, these privacy settings will be applied and these privacy settings will be, uh, as, as more and more privacy regulation comes in and these settings become more and more uh, uh, complex and, and more and more effective, they'll be, uh, effectively applied uh, using this middleware. We also envisaging a middleware which sort of, uh, um, as you are about, this middleware, as you're about to tweet something which is potentially, which reveals more information than perhaps you should, maybe it's tagged with your, your private content. Uh, the middleware would uh, have settings that would prevent that. So, so definitely on the privacy side is definitely our goal to make the problem better, not worse. Uh, if I understand Kate's uh, primary concern is that this could make polarization worse uh, or not improve it. Now, again, we absolutely want to sort of put safeguards in that doesn't make it worse. So that's the part that I didn't talk about much, uh, but we have had uh, uh, conversations with several industry experts and, and the primary question we asked them, uh, what kind of guardrails do you expect putting on middleware? Uh, what should the best mechanism be for these guardrails, which at least doesn't make the problem worse? We never took it as a charter to make the problem better. And I think Frank has a philosophical, and that's why I think there's a normative, uh, there's a normative scoping that we did. And Katrina, I really appreciate the fact that you said we should we should dream bigger and we and that's really reaffirming. But I think what Kate observed about our scoping is exactly correct. I think we definitely did not scope ourselves uh, to make the problem of polarization better. Uh, we scoped ourselves to make it no worse while taking the power of our platforms. And that's a normative scoping choice that we made. I think Frank as a philosopher is perhaps uh, best equipped to uh, comment on that. Yeah, I mean, it's not a philosophical question. It's a question of political realism. Uh, so for example, uh, the technical question that I think uh, Katrina was asking is, how does the user interact uh, and the middleware company interact with the platform? And you know, under our idea, the um, the middleware choices go back to the platform and the platform implements uh, that in the feed that the user gets. Now, why do we do it that way? It's because we think that the platforms may be willing to uh, 
uh, may be willing to tolerate that because it doesn't undermine their business model. Now, you could imagine a world in which you just regulate the platforms. You say you must carry this sort of content or you may not carry this kind of content. But unfortunately, I just don't think we live in that kind of a, a, a world right now. With Kate's uh, question, you know, I, I guess, um, so I, I agree with you that the level playing field and the marketplace of ideas are kind of 18th century notions that really have been belied by a lot of what's happened in recent decades. But, you know, the question then becomes, uh, how do you actually regulate uh, content that you think is noxious, harmful, uh, and and the like, uh, and do it in a way that's consistent with the First Amendment? Now, I think you can push the boundaries a bit because the First Amendment does not allow you to say anything you want. But among liberal democracies, you know, our First Amendment law is, you know, among the most expansive uh, of any developed democracy. Uh, and you could imagine a future world in which we kind of pull that back and we say, you know, we're going to have, uh, you know, a law closer to that of Germany where we can designate, the government can designate something as hate speech and then, uh, you know, prevent the dissemination of that. Uh, but the question then is politically, how are you going to get there, uh, given the current degree of polarization? You know, this is this is something that makes all ideas for political reform really hard to contemplate in this particular moment, because to do almost anything, you have to have some minimal degree of agreement between Republicans and Democrats. And uh, it's not clear that that exists, given how polarized we are. However, I would say that the one good thing about uh, middleware is that it does not obviously benefit one party or the other, right? Uh, precisely the reasons that liberals don't like middleware, you know, that it allows conservatives to gather in these, uh, you know, in these spaces uh, where only they talk to each other uh, is, uh, you know, that's, well, first of all, I, I don't know how you're going to prevent them from doing that, but you could, you know, try to imagine a world in which it's possible to limit that sort of activity. It's a very different uh, world than the one we're used to living in with, you know, our highly developed First uh, First Amendment law. But maybe that's the discussion. Maybe if we're dreaming big, we should say, how would you, you know, modify the American First Amendment to make it possible? But then you further need to answer the question, you know, who's going to make the decision on what's hate speech and what's unacceptable content uh, on uh, on the internet. There may be, a, again, a future world in which we will be less polarized and there will actually be some degree of political consensus on that question, but, you know, we're not there, uh, we're not there yet. I'm curious, this morning there was a, um a bill announced the Filter Bubble Transparency Act, which would require internet platforms to let people use a version of their services where uh, algorithms are not, and recognizing that it sounds ridiculous to even say this as a technologist, but where algorithms are not driving the dynamics, what by which they mean, uh, by which, where algorithmic curation presumably or, or collaborative filtering is not driving the dynamics. And so allowing people effectively to toggle back to a reverse chronological feed it is. It does have bipartisan sponsors. It is not middleware, but it, it does uh, attempt to compel this this um, this process whereby <laughs> we'll see, in fact, an entirely uh, uncurated, if you will, or, or simply chronologically curated feed. I'm curious, recognizing you probably haven't looked at this particular act, but just just that description. Um, this idea of the reverse chronological feed being a healthier default, perhaps, than any kind of algorithmic curated feed, um, middleware or otherwise, where, where you see the, the value or the harm uh, in, in such a proposal? Uh, you know, I just don't think that's going to work. Um, there's a whole bunch of curation that the platforms already do with regard to child pornography, you know, hate, I mean, certain forms of hate speech, violent depictions of violence, uh, and so forth. And, 
uh, if that just becomes transparent, but you just see whatever is posted there, that's going to be a pretty awful world to have to live in. Uh, and so I do think that there is a filtering uh, process for non-political uh, data that uh, is inevitable, and the platforms are really the only companies that are big enough to, you know, to manage that. However, the transparency part of it might be a good idea. I mean, right now, why does uh, YouTube not let you see, I don't know, some person being beheaded or disemboweled or something like that? Well, you don't know. Uh, you don't even know that you don't know because you don't see it. And it could be that you could imagine uh, they're being forced to make explicit uh, what they feed into the algorithm uh, to uh, filter uh, the stuff that, that that comes out the other end. Uh, so that, I think, would be a, a genuine step forward. Um, can I, uh, may, may I respond, uh, may I give some more context uh, around uh, my answer to Kate's question? And I also actually have a question for her, uh, if I may. Yes, please do. So I think uh, one of the ways in which we are thinking, uh, so I mentioned that it's absolutely our goal not to make uh, polarization a hate speech first. And so the way we are internally thinking of it is that uh, one of the reasons it's hard for platforms to satisfy everybody is because they have to make a single decision. And it's hard, uh, building on what Frank was saying in a democracy, it's hard to decide, uh, lay out in a democratic society, uh, even in the absence of polarization, exactly what the right, label is or exactly what the right uh, uh, boundary is between free speech and censorship or how aggressive should someone be in mislabeling or removing content. But our hope is that if instead of providing an exact point saying this is exactly how this piece of content should be uh, treated and having that be regulation, could we have like regulatory guardrails saying that a middleware who acts as an editor cannot go, has to meet these basic journalistic standards. And that's our hope. Uh, to perhaps improve the problem slightly, though of course uh, Kate's uh, argument that this is not going to solve the problem uh, is definitely right. We, ho we hope to improve it via these guardrails around uh, middleware. Uh, and those guardrails would be there in a regulatory sense. These would be regulatory guardrails. And they could be in the form of auditing requirements by the platforms. They could be in the form of if, two, if, they, if there's a piece of content on which middleware uh, recommendations uh, diverge wildly. So between the Heritage Foundation and the New York Times, then the platform is required to also say, well, there's not agreement around this labeling, around this editorial choice. But uh, since you have studied this for a, for a long time, Kate, I would also love to understand, this is what we are thinking. What, what do you think uh, would be, uh, would the middleware need to do to at least have you believe that the problem is at least not getting worse? Yeah, I, the, the guardrails is interesting. I was thinking that a, a little bit, I'm like, okay, so you could limit what kind of middleware would be <laughs> used on the platform, right? It, with some sort of regulation, but then the conversation about cen censorship gets reoriented to right there, right? So instead of being around the platform censoring, you know, content, the, it becomes around the platform censoring who, who provides the middleware. And I imagine that will just sort of displace that piece of the conversation. Um, but yes, I, I, I do think if a proposal like this were to go forward, I think it'd be critical to make sure that, the, that there are there's some standards for, um, for the kinds of editorial decisions that the middleware is making. But again, that's gonna alienate the, 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 the folks who really want a certain kind of mill, they're gonna want a certain kind of middleware product. Um, but of course, you know, someone, some enterprising folks will try to hit right at that sweet spot that they're, that you know the Breitbart uh, uh, trusted news uh, piece on, on Facebook, they'll try to hit right there where they can get into that set. And I, you know, that that may that may be a way forward. Again, I think by but just by focusing on labeling, it's going to miss a little bit. Um, I think there's got to be some sort of feedback that affects the recommendation systems, who people get recommended and who they follow. And how that information gets fed back into, um, you know, I, I, I think that's why sort of if there are any technologists uh, in the audience, uh, uh, other than Katrina, who I can see, um, uh, that, I think that would be like a fascinating uh, research direction if this proposal were to move forward. Like uh, because we don't, we want the middleware to be separate, not between the user and the platform. How can the middleware uh, 
provide not just labels for specific tweets or pieces of content, but actually provide ranking algorithms uh, to the platform. I think that would be sort of, I think uh, when it comes to just providing labels, I feel the AI tools are already there, that an enterprising company could build this product and the enterprising companies which are building it. And I feel like this is where the technical frontier is. Can they? Can you not just provide labels, but can a third party provide input to the ranking algorithm used by a platform? And that's definitely part of our vision is not part of a demo because I feel this is a technically hard piece that we need to figure out over the years. I'm curious if you've seen any of the um, the work that Project Gobo at MIT had done on this. Um, there was a, uh, I believe Ethan Zuckerman's lab over there was, was doing some interesting work with this question actually, um, incorporating multiple feeds and creating tools by which users could influence what, what ranked more or less highly. Did you want to see tweets from women, for example, or were there certain types of um, you know, structures or types of posts that, that you wanted to um, rank or, um, you know, or, or down rank, I suppose, or not, not amplify? Um, and it's, it's an interesting question. It was uh, this, this question of how do you put more power in the hands of the user? This says, in effect, um, put more hands in the power of a middleware provider that caters to groups or communities or types of, of users where there's going to be some affinity marketing that is definitely going to come into that, that middleware proposal. Um, I don't know if you've seen Gobo. If, if not, I can <laughs> just kind of move on to, uh, to a totally different question. I mean, I, I, I have not, but I wouldn't be surprised if Katrina or Kate have run into it. Well, so I, I, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, no go ahead. Just like just one. No, I was going to say, I, I don't have a deep sort of experience with this particular model, but it does raise for me, I think, what is a really interesting question in the space, which is the question of individual control. Um, and I feel like you're trying to walk an interesting line here. And in some of your discussion of the, the platform and its benefits, you were talking about potentially the possibility of delegated decision making. So individuals actually are less saddled with a you know, moment by moment decision making. And I think that's a really appealing and important direction for this to go. But at the same time, you've talked about introducing more individual control. And I have to say, personally, I worry about individual control as sort of a framework for discussing a lot of these data rights issues because it tends to sort of let the platforms abdicate responsibility. It tends to place responsibility on individuals for making the right decisions. And if things go wrong, it's because they made the wrong decisions and they didn't turn the right knobs. And it generally involves exposing individuals to sort of impossible and terrible decisions um, or no, no real decisions at all. So I wonder sort of how you're thinking about individual control in the context of your design. Uh, I think that um, we, uh, the way we're thinking about it is you basically are gonna delegate uh, control over your broad choices to the middle, middleware provider. And that will then relieve you of the need to actually go in and research every tweet for its credibility and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I think that's the basic idea. Um, you know, as we were talking about this, it seemed that there were uh, some potential backers of middleware that could be quite powerful. I mean, this gets to uh, the complaint about labeling and whether that's ineffective. I, I think the current forms of labeling are uh, not very effective. However, you could get, let's say, a coalition of all of the major universities in the United States to back a middleware company that rated uh, websites for academic integrity, academic credibility, and basically said, you know, um, if you write a paper, you have to show that, you know, the information you got came through that particular uh, that particular filter. And you know, if that's a mandate from such a coalition, that's you know that's pretty powerful. That's just that's not a matter of uh, individual choice. And so it kind of substitutes a kind of private institutional power for the uh, individual's uh, you know private uh, individual choice. I, I guess I, I spend so much time with content from folks for, for whom anything that was a collaboration or around all from all of the universities would be, you know, automatically 
rejected as fake news and a, a liberal plot against them. So I guess my 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 difficulty is I, I I spend too much time looking at that that group that's already highly sort of down an anti-epistemic rabbit hole and uh, anti epistemology right? They don't they they've they're changed. How how big how what as a percentage of the American population, how many people are down that rabbit hole? It's, and, yeah, it's hard. It's hard to qu quantify. I think, and I, I, th I thought it was small initially, and, and re really small. But then we get, you know, thirty percent of people will say that they, um, they believe that the election was rigged, and then so it's it's got these blurry boundaries um, that are that are getting bigger around vaccines and voter fraud and masks and things based on some of these these mm -hmm. dynamics that are that are spreading that kind of um, that kind of distrust more broadly. And that's what th this information is. It, it's hard, like the, the spread of sort of distrust in institutions, um, and or, or that's one of its pervasive disinformation has that effect. Mm -hmm. I have a question that was actually submitted um, via video, and since we're getting to at around um, twelve minutes left or so, I'm going to to move us into taking some Q and A from the audience as well to expand the focus of the conversation. Um, the first is from Jonathan Zetrain. He's the George Bemis, excuse me, Professor of International Law, Computer Science and Public Policy at Harvard, and the co-founder and director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. I will let our, uh, our AV team play that video. Hello, and thanks for offering up these proposals. I particularly like the middleware one. And a few years ago, I mocked up how a feed recipe uh, might work. Uh, let me just pull it up on the screen here. Uh, as you can see, uh, it offers a somewhat sleep-inducing set of sliders to try to let users better pick what sorts of things go into their feeds. And for those who don't want to set sliders, they could designate proxies whose recipes they would use instead, like Columbia Journalism School or Bernie, or if he's not deplatformed, Alex Jones. While this would help with unbundling Facebook's opaque and centralized feed recipe from the other functions Facebook serves, it seems like it could make the filter bubble problem maybe a little bit worse. Users would end up asking to emphasize material that otherwise might be downranked. And of course, by picking their proxies, they're gonna be picking the world they wanna be in. I think I'm at peace with that trade-off, but I'm curious what you all think about ways in which various forms of compelled decentralization will in fact fragment people's experience of the world even more than is happening now. Thanks again, and sorry I'm not there. <clears throat> it's, a it's a complex problem, uh, and I think uh, it's related to also what uh, Kate was highlighting. Uh, we don't really have uh, a full magic bullet, but we do think that there are auditing guidelines and regulatory guardrails than what could play, put in place to avoid uh, um, at least making the problem worse. And uh, one example of the guardrails that I mentioned could just be if there's a big if there's a big discrepancy between how a piece of content is labeled by different middleware providers, then that should be uh, or how it's treated by different middleware providers. Then the platform should flag that. So you at least you see not just one. Uh, well, for this high various content, you see a, a variety of views and not just one view. We can imagine each platform laying down its own uh, journalistic guidelines and uh, requiring that middleware providers adhere to those journalistic guidelines. Uh, we, we could require, in addition, we could require the middleware to publish the most interesting idea that I saw from uh, uh, someone in the tech world was uh, around mm -hmm. requiring middleware to publish their own journalistic uh, manifesto and holding them accountable to it. And I know that these are not uh, simple, sure, like these are not like magic bullets that are gonna solve the problem, but it, it is a complex problem. And I do feel like uh, having these uh, range of strategies, identifying different opinions when the middleware is different, the platform providing regulatory guidelines, the middleware is being required to publish a journalistic manifesto uh, and having to stick to it. Um, I. I, I do think these can make a difference, but I, I, I don't want to minimize the problem. This relates to another question from the audience that I think is a nice follow on to that, which is who will audit the middleware and define its standards? So what is the mechanism? Uh, I believe in your original 
Journal of Democracy article, you um, argued that perhaps the president should be um, looking at a new regulatory agency of some sort, as opposed to many proposals that are pointing to the FTC or existing regulatory agencies. Um, somewhere in, in uh, one of the your writings or responses, you had argued for something distinct and different. And I'd love to, to hear more about this auditing and standard definition. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think this is one of the big issues in regulation, uh, whether you want to create a new agency to meet a new problem or try to modify an existing agency. I just think that the digital world that's emerged in the last 10 years is so completely different from everything uh, we've experienced uh, before that you really do need to start over again and create a separate uh, digital regulator that will be able to attract, you know, new talent, uh, uh, you know, to this area and will focus very, very uh, precisely on the kinds of issues that we're, uh, we're talking about. Um, so I think, I mean, there's obviously a lot of other things that need to be regulated as well, if we can ever break the gridlock in Congress to do anything. But uh, yes, I, I think there's a, a lot to be said for that. Uh, you know, there's this, um, the first regulator was the uh, Interstate Commerce Commission, which regulated railroads. And when um, trucking came along in the 1930s and 40s, they said, oh, well, you know, we'll give trucking regulation to the uh, ICC because it's just moving stuff on from one place, one part of the country to another. And it was a total mess because the economics of trucking is completely different from the economics of railroads. Uh, and so they actually then had to split those functions uh, together. So I think you can anticipate a problem like that uh, and uh, you know, start over again with a new regulator. Uh, you know, on, on Jonathan's uh, question, I think honestly, uh, we don't know whether we'll, we're gonna make the world uh, worse or not. Uh, I do think that there is a degree to which some of these ideas uh, spread that uh, will be limited by uh, our proposal. On the other hand, you know, if people want to be polarized and believe in crazy things, they're going to find a way to do it regardless of what the technology is. I mean, in India, WhatsApp has been used, you know, to spread a lot of hate speech. Uh, and that's just a messaging service, you know. That actually gets really nice lead into the last question that I think we have time for, which is this problem of it doesn't just stay online. And so there's an entire Wikipedia entry actually on how misinformation on WhatsApp in India has led to, I think, close to a dozen murders at this point. Um, so one of the points to raise on this front then is, does, and this is a question from the audience um, that I think draws out that responsibility question very directly. Will the middleware reinforce the argument of platforms being only a mere conduit, which will then allow further avoidance of responsibility for the content that they host and the impact that it does then have uh, in the real world? Because presumably, if the platforms are not taking down, moderating, labeling, doing things to mitigate the real world harms, particularly for certain subtypes of content, um, where does that responsibility devolve down into if a proliferation of middleware providers has, has taken over that role? Uh, I can't imagine at this point in our politics that the platforms uh, facing a challenge from middleware providers is going to say, you know, hot damn, we can do whatever we want. You know, we can put all this shit up on the platform and nobody's going to blame us because we got middleware. And I, mean, I just don't think it's going to happen that way. I, I think that politically they've been under the gun. I think they'll be very, well, they're, they're going to complain like crazy because it does impact their business model. Uh, although we can minimize that as Ashish was saying. Uh, but I do think that in the end, uh, it is something that is in their long-term interest. And I cannot see them you know, they're not so evil that they're trying to figure out, you know, how can we make society worse? Ah, here's a new opportunity to do that. Let's let's go for it. And You know what I've been thinking? I mean, already they're not doing a great job with certain sort of language communities and certain cultures. Um, and granted, like it's uh, my first thought is like most content won't be labeled because how on earth will these middleware companies keep up with all this content? It's that's a, a huge challenge. But for specifically targeted communities, it would open up the opportunity for them to actually 
um, create products for their own communities yeah. and remove that from the, the platforms not not paying attention to it. So it actually does have, uh, provide this opportunity for com communities, communities to protect themselves, which is something we've been advocating for as well. So in that piece, it, it, there's a compelling opportunity there. Uh, and if I could also add the international dimension, uh, you know, what was it like 85% of all the content moderation that Facebook does is based in the U.S. Uh, for U.S. users, and that's 15% for the entire rest of the world, and they just don't have the capacity to understand the politics of Myanmar sufficiently to really know what they're doing. And I think uh, middleware is a great opportunity for people in every country in the world to organize civil society groups, you know, can create uh, a middleware platform that will, you know, help their citizens uh, get through this morass of bad information. I think that's an excellent point. I think as we are uh, coming up on the close, it sounds like uh, I'd like to invite any of the panelists to offer final thoughts if there's something that they um, that hasn't been raised yet that they'd like to to cover. Well, then I would like to thank Frank and Ashish for this excellent conversation, for putting forth uh, this proposal, for encouraging us to think deeply about this particular facet of the issue, what areas it, you know, the pros and cons, the trade-offs, the ways in which uh, we might succeed in an implementation. And to say uh, thank you so much to our panelists, to Katrina and Kate for their thoughtful responses. And I will turn it back over to Dan and the HAI team. And this is Eric, I'll take up it from here. Uh, thanks so much, Renee, and thanks, uh, Frank, Ashish, Katrina, Kate. That was a, a terrific discussion. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to think about these issues. We're going to take a, a five-minute break, and then we'll be back with our panel discussion with a radical proposal on uh, universal basic income uh, with Andrew Yang and the rest of the team. So please come back in about five minutes, and we'll get started again. Thanks again, everyone. <laughs>